Hello everyone, I think we'll make a start because I think it's 9.30, just after 9.30 and we have most people here. Um, there might be some people still joining, but um, we'll continue with some maybe just short introductions of the people um, who are attending this morning. So as you probably all know, this is um, a COSME funded project. It was about social economy missions. So, so supporting the social economy and social enterprises. Um, there's three participating regions altogether. We have the Northern Western region, Ireland. We have Sibiu County in Romania, and we have Haju Bihar region in Hungary. Apologies if I didn't pronounce that properly, but uh, Tunde can um, correct me. Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now to, so we can see everyone. But uh, Okay, so I suppose from Ireland, uh, the people, I'm not too sure everyone who uh, everyone's here yet, but our kind of stakeholders, I'm just going to look at our participant list, is um, a mix of the local development companies or rural development companies that would uh, sometimes historically would have been referred to as the leader companies as they manage the leader funding and a lot of uh, community and social inclusion programs uh, funded through the EU. Um, we also have uh, Chagas, which are the main kind of food and farming and rural development organization in Ireland. Um, and we also have another a number of community organizations or initiatives involved in the food chain, such as uh, Anne Kitchen, which is Irish for Kitchen. Uh, they're based in Ross, County Roscommon, um, and they provide a lot, a, a lot of a valuable resource and you know, for food producers, but also for people to train up to be chefs and uh, learn new skills. Um, and we also have uh, good, a lot of good practice examples like um, the uh, Edible Landscape Project in um, Westport in County Mayo. That again, that produce uh, lo local food and um, help uh, local people in Mayo learn about new skills in terms of growing their own fruit and veg. So a lot of um, good examples. Um, I, I'll let Doris just do a quick introduction to her stakeholders and then Tunde from Hungary to do an introduction to her stakeholders and then we'll do a short poll just to get an idea of the people uh, are here. Is that okay, Doris? Perfect, thank you. I actually wanted to start before you started, but uh, just to inform the Romanian stakeholders about the translation. So we have a button of translation. So if the um, support, the technical support for this conference, uh, if he can help me saying it very briefly in Romanian for everyone. So we have uh, both Romanian English and English Romanian translation. So maybe uh, Aline, if you want to say a few words before. Da, mulțumesc frumos, Doris, pentru acei dintre dumneavoastră care au nevoie de traducere simultană din engleză în limba română sau în momentul în care veți vorbi, puteți vorbi în română și se va traduce în limba engleză. Aveți în colțul din dreapta jos al butoanelor de Zoom, butonul de Interpretation, și pentru a asculta canalul de uh, limba română, alegeți uh, România uh, sau of dacă cunoașteți ambele limbi și nu aveți nevoie de, uh, de traducere. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so you, you, you were able also to hear in English what they were, what they were said in, in, uh, in Romanian. So I love that we are very technical. Anyway, so a um, uh, warm welcome from my side here at the Sibiu County Council. We are a partner in this amazing project um, and our stakeholders uh, present today, uh, I love to, to say that um, they cover a wide range of, uh, of uh, people. We have the uh, Astra Museum, we have the Sibiu County Tourism Association, we have our uh, great support NGO, My Transylvania, My Transylvania, that's here with us. We have the Lucian Blaga University also present with us. Uh, a few people from the local action groups and also um, representatives from local gastronomic points. Um, and these are actually the um, end um, or, or the start uh, or, or the start of the route, which are 
the local producers. So uh, I'm happy to be here with you all and um, I wish you all an enjoyable conference time. I'm really sorry that we were not able to travel to Ireland, but uh, Patrick promised that um, maybe if uh, traveling time allows it, maybe we can all be visiting uh, Ireland um, late fall. So uh, if you don't mind, I will pass now the floor to um, Tunde. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doris. Thank you, Patrick. Hello, everybody. Uh, warm welcome from Hungary. I am Tunde, and uh, with my colleagues, Judith and Melinda, we represent uh, the Hungarian partner of this wonderful project, Hajdu Bihar County Government. And uh, fortunately, we also have our focus group members on board today, including the representatives of the uh, County Directorate of the Hungarian Chamber of Agriculture, the National Employment Fund, some farmer support and coordinating organizations like uh, Farmers PAC and Pantria Fajdúság. Uh, and also we have uh, some farmers and producers here with us today. Thank you very much and I wish all of you a wonderful day. Thank you, Tunde. Uh, I'll just gonna, I haven't tried this poll function before, so I'm just gonna try it now. Um, and Aline can guide me if I'm going wrong. So. Uh, this is just a quick poll to see what organization you're representing. So there's a number of options. You can be either private sector, so you're either far farmer, grower, producer, social enterprise, a government body, so that includes local, regional, uh, national or EU or leader company, or if you're an agency like industry such as Chamber of Commerce, um, and we've other there as well. So I think let's wait for another few more responses. So hopefully everyone can see the poll, can they? Yeah. Okay. I think we probably have all the responses now at this stage. So Aline, I think I've seen when I just click end poll. Is that correct? Sorry, still a few more responses coming in. Yes, if you want, you you click on end polling, and after that, you can share the results uh, with everybody. Okay. Okay, so you can see probably slightly more government body here in terms of um, representative, and then there's kind of an equal distribution between, say, private businesses, social enterprises, and local development companies, and then we have a few other as well. Um, so maybe later on towards at the end, we can, those people who are other can say who they are and what they're hoping to get out of the workshop. Um, okay. Uh, I will have a few polls later on as well. Um, so I'm just gonna share my presentation now. Seconds. Can everyone see that? Yeah, okay, it's good. Um, so, so yeah, this is um, this is a social economy um, called local food chains, and I think everyone maybe has got an email or something for me. So my name is Patrick Devine. I'm an EU project officer at the Northern Western Regional Assembly. Um, we're one of three regional assemblies in Ireland, and we cover uh, eight counties in the Northwest region. So from Galway up as far as Donegal and including a number of the border counties, um, Leitrim, Cavan and Monaghan. Um, so last year, the EU Commission and as part of the COSME project launched this call for social economy emissions. Um, and it was about enhanced integration, interaction, um, seconds, uh, interaction, improved collaboration between existing social economy networks, stakeholders, uh, regional and local level in the field of priorities of social economy emissions. And it, there was, I think, seven or eight priorities that um, uh, organizations could apply for. And we went with the, the theme or the, the priority of kind of rural and agricultural development and sustainability. So the social economy mission is really about sharing good practices and mutual learning between the three regions and the social economy um, at an interregional level and contribute to the gradual building of social economy community 
It will bring together local government bodies, SMEs, social enterprises operating in the food chain, such as farmers, social farmers, producers, suppliers and distributors and community kitchens. And I think this is really a, the, the social economy mission in general. Um, I think it, it, it's a recognition by both the EU Commission and each of the member states, you know, that the social, social economy has a really important role uh, in the economy in general, but also to providing um, jobs uh, and has a good, so, has a social impact that's really important right across each of the regions. Uh, so this is the kind of the, the, the group of stakeholders that we're trying to involve in the project. We obviously have farmers and social farms, uh, community gardens and growers, um, chefs and restaurants obviously play a really important role in terms of sourcing local food, but also chefs and restaurants tend to be kind of ambassadors for local food. Um, and quite often they provide an important connection between consumers and um, local produce, if, even if it's just you know, promoting the food on their menu or sharing it on maybe TV channels or stuff like that there. You also have food markets is a really important uh, a uh, distribution and channel for really for local uh, producers to sell their food. And we quite often see farmers and growers uh, at starting to become more popular, sell talking to consumers directly as well. The consumers themselves obviously really Kind of drive everything in terms of um, the demand for um, local produce. Community organizations such as things like Meals and Wheels and Community Kitchens obviously play a really important role as well. And then you have a lot of charities and civil society organizations like we discussed earlier, and then the likes of ourselves, which are the policy makers and uh, local government. Um, so these are the three regions. Um, I think, as I mentioned previous, we have the Northern Western region in Ireland. We have the Hadju Bihar County in Hungary, which is kind of the Northeast of Hungary. And then we have Sibiu County, which is, I've been to, it's a lovely part of Romania, kind of pretty much on the Transylvania area. Very nice if you haven't been to it. Um, so I think we're all familiar with what a local food chain is, um, but as often called a short uh, food chain, is to reduce the number of intermediaries between the farmer and food producer and the consumer. And in recent years, food chains have become longer and more complex, resulting in poor understanding for consumers about the source of the food. Um, and obviously, if an example, I suppose, is here, if you go into the local market, you might get to meet the farmer that actually grew, grew the carrots. Whereas if you go down to your um, to a sup multinational supermarket, you obviously won't get to meet the, the farmer and most people don't have any interaction or know where the source of their food is. Um, and obviously longer food supply chains have increased logistics resulting in higher carbon emissions, both through transport and packaging. Um, this is, a, I suppose, that was a nice graphic to kind of explain the typical long food chains. You have, you know, the farmer, manufacturing, which sometimes is packaging or adding value or processing the food and package for shipment, transport, distribution to different countries, then goes into uh, local shops. And just, I think this is a nice illustration of how, and each of these uh, intermediaries uh, requires additional packaging and logistics. So it just it really adds up in terms of um, carbon emissions. Uh, and as well, something I often forget as well is that longer food chains tend to result in less profit and financial sustainability for farmers and producers because we obviously think each of these processors have to make some money or profit um, in order to run their business. So quite often that tends to drive down um, the overall price for the farmer or producer at the beginning. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the, the connection between the consumer here at the end and the farmer is totally lost because you have so many intermediary bodies. Um, so one of the reasons we decided to come up with this particular um, social economy is because the last year, obviously, the European Commission published the EU Green Deal, and uh, as well as the Green Deal published a number of sub strategies. Um, and one of them was the farm to fork strategy. Um, and here you see it says the farm to fork strategy is as special as it is the first time for the EU food policy to have a comprehensive strategy encompassing all stages of the food system and putting consumers and producers in the center. As EU agriculture currently represents 
of EU greenhouse gases. The farm to fork strategy is a crucial to deliver the EU green deal. So obviously the main focus for the EU Commission publishing this was to acknowledge this 10% uh, of all greenhouse gases comes from agriculture and to try and reduce this. Um, and we can go into this in more detail later on, but you can see these are the four pillars that uh, the EU Commission are looking at in terms of sustainable food production, sustainable food processing distribution, sustainable food consumption, and reducing food loss and prevention. Um, this is another uh, um, infographic explaining some of the targets that were set out in the food farm to fork strategy. So there's uh, an increase for agriculture, fisheries, and aquaculture to, to reduce, uh, increase their targets um, to reduce greenhouse uh, gases by over 50%. The proposal is that 25% of all the land across the member states is going to be used for organic farming. So that's a, a big increase. And also a 20% reduction in the use of fertilizers and 50% reduction in the use of pesticides and 50% reduction reduction in antimicrobial use, use for farm animals. So I think for just general and uh, agriculture and growers in general, there's going to be a lot of changes coming uh, in the next uh, EU program period of next seven years, and which is from 2021 to 2027. Um, I know the, uh, the cap is still being the common agricultural policy a proposal that was I think published in 2018 so I think it's still um, the case and I know it was it's been debated at the European Parliament and by policy advisors at the minute um, but obviously a key part of this is the um, the food value chain and making important changes in, the, in that there and um, because it links into all the other um, important objectives as well and we can come back to this for discussion later on. Um, this um, there's another e Horizon 2020 project called Short Food Chain, and they summarised the 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 importance of having local food chain uh, into three pillars: economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. Um, and I won't read them all out because I know we're short on time, but you can see. Uh, there's a lot of benefits in terms of uh, increased profitability for farmers and social farmers, generates local uh, employment. Um, it also preserves uh, farming and kind of traditions in, in different regions and local areas. There's obviously the environmental sustainability in terms of reduction in greenhouse gases, energy use, um, and ecological soundness of production methods. Um, and short food supply chains tend to also has less food miles and reduces food waste and less packaging. Then you also have the social aspect of it as better connection, obviously, between producers and consumers and a sense of trust and uh, obviously better community integration. Uh, so we can come back to that later if we want for discussion. Um, so the aim of the project is really to share common problems and learn from other EU regions. Uh, identify models and best practices for financial sustainability of social enterprises, support the viability of social enterprises by developing tool toolkits to connect um, with consumers. And so this is, we did some desktop research last year when we we're applying for this project. And this is some of the challenges we found facing local community farms growers. Uh, achieving a fair price uh, and sustainable profit for, for the produce, competition from produce imported at reduced costs, seasonality, lack of consumer awareness, poor infrastructure for distribution and delivery, and access to resources for capital to invest in new equipment and technology. So you can let me know if you think these are challenges in your region or um, is there any challenges that we've missed out on here? Um, and hopefully we can uh, try and address some of these through the good practices that we're going to discuss later on. Um, and that's my presentation. So stop sharing now. Um, I know we're, sorry, we're running a wee bit short on time. So I think I'll move over to Joanne, uh, if that's okay. Joanne, are you able to share your screen? Yeah, I am, yeah, I'll start now. I will do Thank some maybe Q&A after your presentation. All right. Okay, so can you, what do we see if I can, um, 
slight chill. That's why I hide that uh, from beginning. Okay. Uh, can you see that okay? Yes, perfect. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a million, Patrick. Um, my name's Joanne Butler. I'm from Organic Gardens, which is a, a small local enterprise uh, with a big social impact, hopefully, uh, uh, in Northwest Donegal. So we're an educational growing garden and our ethos is our community, our future and our food. So I'm just going to give you a wee presentation today about what we do, how we how we became who we are and um, hopefully uh, our thoughts for the future. So Organic Gardens is based in northwest Donegal. We're looking out at a beautiful mountain scenery. Uh, this is the view that I have right now from the office that I'm sitting in. Uh, I'm glad I took this photograph because it's a bit cloudy today. The weather uh, is a bit overcast here. So um, my story began, I suppose, back in 2005. Um, I moved from the city uh, of Derry uh, down into Donegal and became from a city girl to the country life. And at the time, uh, it was very new to me about access to local food and to be able to just walk up uh, to a local farmer and ask him, uh, could I take some cabbages from the field? And this is an actual photograph from back then. Um, but it really piqued my interest in where our food comes from. And I think that's what started my journey. Uh, moving forward then a few years, quite a few years to 2013, um, I had started my own family. And with that, we had we had bought a, a house with a site of four acres, uh, as I say, looking out at the mountain, uh, but with the potential to grow food. And at the time, my, my interest in, in the local food and where our food comes from uh, mixed with the fact that I had young children and I wanted them to be able to access good, healthy uh, food as well, really got me started into wanting to grow food for the family at the time. Uh, and then in I started to use social media, I suppose, with the photographs that I was doing. And back then, uh, my local community group thought that I knew what I was doing by putting the photographs up of my project, which was very, um, very new in the early days. Uh, Harvest. This was one of my first ever harvests. I uh, got their interest and they asked me if I would like to start to teach in the local community garden there. And back then it was for me, it was becoming a passion about growing food and learning myself as a, as a mother of young children. But the first time that I brought people together to grow food in a community setting really got me interested and uh, excited about the idea that we could bring people together and we could talk about our food and we could grow food uh, on a very small scale. So in 2014, I started to work in a few community gardens around Donegal and bringing people together, again, talking about food and really uh, starting to... Um, uh, uh, get a network of people uh, in the area. So we were gathering together, coming together, saving our seeds, growing the vegetables. Uh, we knew what we were we were eating. We were talking about the food. Uh, we were talking about uh, world resources such as soil, water, fossil fuel, uh, and working together, eating fresh food that was in season. So the more that I was working with my community groups, um, the more that I started to think about the idea and the, the ripple effect, I suppose. Um, back then, I was, I was still very small scale uh, and I was growing also my own garden as well. But when we came together as community groups, we would share the food. And I think that um, that also was very important because I remember one time asking one of the, the groups, you know, who here uh, grows their own food? This was at the very beginning of coming together, uh, coming together as a group and nobody put up their hand. But then I said, well, whose parents would have grown their own food and maybe half the group and then whose grand the whole group put their hands up. So it was very important then, uh, you know, I knew that, that we were not only uh, losing the losing the skill of growing food, but also losing knowledge uh, that we had, uh, or the access to the food as well. 
in 2016 then I had started to uh, expand then with the with the groups that I was working in and we started the Donegal Community Garden Network. Uh, this was a network then of uh, almost 20 community gardens coming together, exploring what they were doing together and also uh, talking again about food and local food systems. So the idea was that we wanted to act local, uh, think global and make the choices that count. Uh, I also joined Community Gardens Ireland then in uh, 2017, became a committee member. Um, this is a all Ireland network of community gardens, again, exploring all those ideas, but coming together then to share what we were doing uh, in larger forums, such as this is an electric picnic, one of the large festivals, music festivals, uh, pre-COVID life uh, in Ireland. And that we would have come together and we set up in a space called Global Green, which was on the edge of the festival, but it was a, an exciting opportunity to show people uh, what we were doing all around the country. Now, in 2017, I also was working an awful lot outreach. So I was leaving my garden every day, uh, packing up a garden into the back of my car and going out uh, and educating people around. But once, uh, one time someone said to me, wow, you must have a great garden at home. And I thought, you know, I'm so busy doing all these other garden projects. I haven't had time to do my own garden. So I thought that what I really need to do is come back home uh, and, and, and create an educational garden where people can come and see what we are growing on site instead of me packing the car up and going to them. So we had these lovely outhouses and uh, that we, we changed into classroom space, a uh, very small classroom space, but it's, a, it's an ongoing project. And in 2017, we opened our doors tentatively, uh, inviting people into our community garden. Um, and as I say there, we have wonderful views of the garden, but what we wanted to know was what the people in the local area were interested in. So we decided to run a, a, a series of introductions, uh, these introductions uh, to see what people were coming to. So what were people interested in the area? We knew that they were interested in growing food, but what else could we could we explore around those themes? So as you can see there, we did seed saving, food foraging, uh, natural wine making, beekeeping and herbalism. And lots of people came. I think in the first year uh, at the garden, we had over 150 rural area. That's a lot of people coming uh, and to, to the garden. Uh, the garden itself is four acres. It's a small holding um, and it's we practice our permaculture uh, principles at the garden. So everything that we do is working with nature uh, rather than against it. And as my three children grow and help me in the garden projects, I've been able to home and, uh, and enjoy the family life as well as the community life as well. But these three guys are the most important uh, parts of the, of the jigsaw for me. So I suppose then opening your door and allowing people to come into your garden uh, and doing lots of different projects uh, allows you to find out what, what people are at in the area. But uh, when we had lots of people coming, we realised that people were prepared to not just come from Donegal, but also coming from further afield. Uh, even though our, our, our network is not that great, but we do have great buses that come straight into the village. Uh, and we did lots of courses then. And pre-COVID, we've been very successful uh, getting people in, volunteers, uh, also as part of our, our weekly uh, projects. So we grow food more or less for the family but then as the garden then started to become bigger uh, we started to stretch out uh, having our food garden and also then our fruit area and our community socializing space i suppose for our volunteers and community members we started a box service then a small very very small box service in 2019 and that went okay but because we were just very limited uh, amount of people volunteering mostly for, from the project we realized the travel out to people's homes was not possible so we set up a little stall at the back of the at the back of the classroom and just invited people to come in so this was running from 2019 and 2020 
but uh, we didn't do it um, during the COVID lockdown. We just weren't able to do it because we didn't couldn't have the, the volunteers or anything. But the idea about the stall was that people could come and they would pick the seasonal fresh produce. We also had uh, a recipe guide of things that maybe people didn't know how to cook or eat um, and people were able to get that. Uh, it was a very small project uh, with the honesty box and people brought their boxes uh, every week. We're also um, a member of the Donegal Food Coast, so we were able to what we were doing then further afield. Um, and this was at one of the uh, more social events, again, pre-COVID. But since then, I suppose what we've done, uh, not just locally, but na uh, nationally as well, we've been able to get involved in quite a few projects. Um, this is a project that we did, a European project with the GROW Observatory, that we were able to um, distribute soil sensors with a citizen science project uh, out to local participants in Donegal and then also in the southeast area of Ireland. Uh, and people were able to take the soil sensors uh, to be able to monitor soil moisture uh, and also to be able to educate uh, people on the importance of looking after our soil. So this is just a few photographs from that project. So we were able to distribute the soil sensors out, as I say, 500 sensors all through Donegal. And then the data then went uh, towards uh, further science projects and uh, universities. Uh, in all that time as well through the stall, we continued it and we were getting the, uh, the linking in with local chefs. So we're delighted to say that even though with COVID, that just this week we've started up again uh, supplying to a, a one local restaurant anyway. And then running courses, um, I suppose the courses that we had um, that we had initially trialed here at the garden, we then went further uh, by running weekend courses uh, on permaculture and also weekend um, on uh, social and therapeutic horticulture. With the projects that we were running here at the garden, we were able to take groups between 15 people if they were in the classroom situation or larger groups then if they just wanted to kind of walk around the gardens, uh, which we, as I say, four acres with the forest uh, food garden now under, underway. And our community garden uh, was growing up to about 15 people on a weekly basis. Our volunteers then would come and help us with the projects as well. And then I suppose one of the most important things was getting the word out there uh, about what we do and who we are and how to get involved. Uh, we're always, you know, looking, we were looking for people uh, to get involved and then running the courses as well um, at the garden. So I think what we've had in the past was really um, interesting uh, talks. These were these talks that I'm showing you now were actually all uh, for during the COVID. Of course, then we had to lock down and uh, and and hold everything for for the time being. But uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get these up and running again. So the Chef's Garden series was uh, an exciting evening that we were going to do where people would come along and they would walk around the garden uh, to see what was in season uh, at, during at different times of the year. And then the chef would join us then uh, and then they pick the produce and then the chef would then cook the produce while they were uh, hopefully sitting and enjoying uh, watching the chef cook. <laughs> So I'm just showing you some. Now, this photograph here was the last. Um, it was the I was just looking at the date uh, yesterday. It was taken on the 5th of March 2020. So the last volunteering event that we had uh, at the garden. And my last uh, outreach event was uh, at a local community garden. And then, of course, once COVID had then it was kind of like locked down then for the last while. So very quickly then what I did is I went online on Facebook uh, and started to just keep promoting what we were doing. I didn't want to kind of disappear for, well, but back then we just thought it was two weeks, but uh, as we all know, it went on for a little bit longer. Uh, so I had to put myself in front of the camera, which at the beginning I found that really uncomfortable to be holding the camera in one hand and trying to talk about uh, how to get in this photograph, keep your strawberries growing uh, and, and talk about that in the other. So what we did um, do in the obviously the Zoom, then the classes on Zoom and, and keeping our community and the people that were accessing the garden and um, keeping them 
keeping them active and making sure that they were growing in their own garden. I started to do a grow your own food classes then um, throughout last year. So far, we've had over 300 um, join the uh, grow your own food courses. Uh, very, very basic growing food, um, how to get started with your seeds um, and, you know, growing through the year and looking at pest, uh, natural pest control, uh, managing our weeds and everything that goes with it. So we're delighted that this is still going. And we just started our new course there last week, which is all about now, I suppose, blended learning. Um, I know we're coming off the screen and people are looking to get back out uh, into their gardens. But the idea of the blended learning, I think, will work very well, just like I'm here talking to you guys today. So with, the, uh, with COVID and being online, I suppose, brought up opportunities for us that we were still active uh, behind the scenes. So our community garden got involved with social farms and gardens uh, and Irish Seed Savers to do a seed guardian project. This is a very exciting project that we have, um, hopefully saving seeds to create a, a local seed library um, that will be in the Northwest area. We're only piloted at the minute with social farms and gardens and the training is with Irish Seed Savers, but hopefully this can actually take off to a new uh, phase next year. So these are just some photographs. I know I'm running out of time. Um, we changed the Donegal uh, Community Garden Network during COVID. We changed it to Donegal Food Growers Network. This was because we were aware that there was lots of people behind the scenes that weren't part of a community garden, but still wanted to access local food or to learn about local food. And then the next opportunity that we have is we've just recently, our community garden group and Donegal Food Growers Network has joined the Open Food Network of Ireland um, to learn about um, online uh, trading and selling our food uh, in, a, in a virtual market, but to have hubs all around Donegal that people can access the local food. So I'll just finish up here now with, I suppose, just a nod to the collaborations and the members that we are part of. Um, at, at Organic Gardens, we are becoming organically certified. So we're in transition at the moment. We're part of Donegal Changemakers, which is a development education, uh, Community Gardens Ireland, Irish Seed Savers. We've had Erasmus Plus students here and formed Synergy Scholarship uh, previous to COVID, and we're proud members of Talav Bio. So just I'll finish up there with a picture of these dirty hands because uh, this is where it all started for me and the importance in our hands into the soil and um, to be able to uh, put your hands into the soil and reconnect with nature. And I think that's what it's all about uh, for me and what I do with the community gardens and also here at Organic Gardens. So to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. And I just want to say thank you very much there. All right, I'll stop sharing. That's, this. that's great, John. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Very inspirational that you're able to turn your kind of passion for growing food and organic food into a business. And I know a lot of people are like uh, community gardens, but also just people that from as a hobby that want to grow their own food. But it can be a wee bit if, you're not, if it's not something you're, it can be a bit overwhelming. So I know a lot of people go to you for because <laughs> uh, your wealth of knowledge in terms of uh, how, what type of seeds and variety of different produce people should be going, growing. growing. Um, I were a wee bit behind in time, but if anybody maybe wants to ask one question, we'll have a longer Q&A at the end. But if anyone wants to raise their hand, I see Christian has his hand up there if you want to unmute yourself. O să pun întrebarea în limba română, că cred că sunt pe canalul de comunicație în limba română. Uh, întrebarea mea e simplă. În uh, miezul activității, adică în ceea ce fac ei de regulă, sunt uh, activități cu voluntari sau sunt oameni care sunt plătiți pentru munca lor? Și dacă sunt ambele cazuri, cum sunt împărțite? Cum, sunt, cum e făcută diferențierea asta între când sunt plătiți oamenii ca voluntari și când nu sunt plătiți ca voluntari? și cum se reflectă alegerile astea în uh, activitatea lor. Mersi. Doris, I don't know if you're able to uh, translate some of that. <laughs> It was all in uh, English also, in the English channel. 
Oh, sorry. I sorry. My apologies. I had it on off. Okay, sorry. So when I had it off at the bottom, the uh, could you maybe just repeat the question? I don't know. I missed it. Just it was the added. You know, the options for for translation are off English or Romanian. Has everybody missed the question, Joanne? Did you guys yeah. miss the question? Yeah. Yeah, I missed the question too. I don't have that option. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so Christian, okay, wanna, do you want to repeat it? Da? Yes. Ok, în uh, care din activitățile de bază, cei care lucrează împreună cu ei sunt voluntari și când sunt situații în care oamenii care lucrează sunt plătiți? Cum diferențiază între aceste două tipuri de activități odată cu voluntari și cu oameni plătiți și cum se reflectă alegerea asta în, în ceea ce fac? Sorry, Joanne, did you get that? I got a little bit. It was breaking up there. Um, okay. I'm not sure. It was about volunteers, was it? Yeah, how do you differentiate between paid staff and volunteers and how they, how they interact and stuff? Okay, okay. Well, because we're, we're very, as I mentioned there, we're very small enterprise. Um, and most of the work that I do at the garden that involves the volunteers, um, I also am one of the volunteers. <laughs> so um, I really only, the, the paid work that I get is for any educational groups that come. Um, and then that goes towards the enterprise. But whenever we do the volunteer days, we're all there together volunteering, um, even my time. So what we do is that when people come to the garden, they, if they volunteer at the garden, they can take their share of vegetables with them. So we generally have people uh, at the garden um, that don't have access to the food themselves. So it's a bartering system like that. Uh, so they're getting their education and their food and they're happy. And they're also getting some of your knowledge as well, John. Yeah, and <laughs> yes. then I'm getting, I'm getting their work as well. So it's... Okay. Uh, <laughs> so it's one, one, one. Yeah. Okay, I'm just conscious of time, so I might um, move to our next presentation, which is Brian Smith from Social Farming uh, Ireland, which is part of the Leitrim uh, development company. Um, I see Brian's just sharing his screen here, so I'll, I think Brian is better introducing himself um, than I will. So I'll hand over to Brian. Thank you, Brian. Just make sure you... Uh, Sorry. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I'll run through quite a bit of information in a short time. Hopefully you'll catch it all. I'm here. Uh, I work with the Leitrim Development Company. We're a local development company. We also work on delivery of the leader program, but I'm here to talk about social farming project, which is a national network project we have, but I'll go through that. Um, so just to give you some background on myself, I'm involved, as I said, in working with the Leader Project, currently working with a number of small scale producer, or producers, uh, milk producer, meat uh, producer, and also horticultural producer, looking at the Leader Initiative, Leader Funding Food Initiative, and developing short supply chains to the local markets. Uh, a dairy of uh, an existing uh, dairy farm, a guy producing some. Uh, Specialized uh, Hereford meat uh, wants to supply locally as well and on the internet, and also a horticultural uh, enterprise wanting to juice. So, currently working with those projects. I'm also director of the Leitrim Organic Farmers Cooperative and the Organic Centre. The Farmers Cooperative is stock farmers, cattle, and sheep, bringing together the strength of organic farmers to, to, to try and enhance the market, uh, inform producers or inform consumers, and get a better price. The Organic Centre is a training centre and promoting organic uh, production. They're also supply. We also run as a local development company on social inclusion uh, measures. We also work very closely with the Food Hub, which we have funded under the Leader Programme. It's Ireland's original, I suppose, food uh, enterprise centre, dedicated food enterprise centre. We have a hospitality operations programme there. We train people in food uh, operations, chefing, and other hospitality operations. We also have a local training initiative funded by the uh, Education and Training Board, and it's, it's a 42-week training program for people in horticultural production. So it's primary and secondary. Uh, so we have quite a lot of interaction in the food side. We also work, I suppose, with Food Cloud as well and the, and the, and the work that they do in, in terms of social inclusion. But I'm here today to talk about social farming and our project, which has 
uh, funding from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Uh, we're in our fifth year now at funding from them. It's, we have a national network of social farmers and other stakeholders, which is participants, advocates, uh, health and social care providers uh, in mental health, disability, education, a wide range of uh, stakeholders. We also in this project provide training induction for social farmers and for participants in getting social farms established and up and running. We provide sample placements, funding for sample placements on social farms initially from the project. And we're also looking to the future in engaging in developing national uh, sustainable commissioning models for placements in social farms. So, and we also have a, a role in public and stakeholder awareness and information about social farming. And this goes back to when we started our first project, which is an interreg funded project in 2011. Uh, and we're also involved in research funded by the department and publishing reports and influence and policy to engage uh, national policy and actions in supporting social farming and the benefits to the people who take part. So what are we? We're structured as a national office with uh, four hubs in each region in the country. And we operate through the local, our colleagues in local development companies. I know that Deirdre, one of our colleagues is here on the call today, Southwest Mayo Development Company, which operates in the West. We cover the border Midlands ourselves. In the Southeast, we have Waterford Leader Partnership. In the Southwest, we have West Limerick Resource. So it's a national coverage with staff in each of the regions. So social farming, what is it? In the Irish context, it's, uh, and, and in the European context also, but in Irish context, it's a planned outcome focused support provided to people with needs or challenges based on a farm by the farmer or grower and their family. So there's a number of elements to that. It's planned. The outcome, it's focused on the outcomes for the individual and it's a support placement. They're not there to work. It's not an employment engagement. It's not a training engagement, although there can be occupational and training outcomes uh, for people and they can move towards training and employment, but it is not an employment uh, engagement. The farm remains and is a typical working farm. We're, I suppose, maintaining the focus on farm-based activity. So it's a typical farm. It's not a company or a social enterprise. They're regular, ordinary Irish farms, uh, which can be vary in size. Uh, and the person goes there, they're in need of support and can benefit from participation in the farm's activities in what is a community a non-clinical setting. Many people that we support on farms are very engaged in services, be the mental health, disability services, at the justice system or whatever, homelessness, uh, in the uh, integration system with um, refugees and asylum seekers. So these people are very much looking for community support. It's focused on the participant goals. So the person who's coming to the farm sets a series of goals and they're delivered to the natural connection that they get with the people on that farm, with the place itself, the environment that's there. That be that the natural environment and the plants and animals or the plants or and, and, and animals on the farm. So it's a natural connection to the seasons, to this, to the season, the seasonality of life, birth in spring, to the senescence in autumn. So it's a natural connection and also to the people and the community that these farmers operate in. So the farmers are connected to their community and that connection builds the support for the individuals. It also provides an opportunity to farmers to connect with their local community in opening up their farms as an inclusive uh, option for people in that community. And we've been told and it's been said that it putting culture back into agriculture because agriculture has moved very much to agribusiness defined by corporations but we see this as adding back to the farm and the value of the farm in communities. So that's what we're talking about. So what's involved? Typically people go to the farm for a short period of time, a day or two a week. The placements currently in Ireland are typically 10 to 20 weeks but increasingly they're longer particularly for people who may have longer uh, needs uh, as in uh, disabilities. Uh, they spend an average of four to eight hours, depending on their needs and depending on their capacity and their abilities. They spend you know, four to eight hours per day out of those one to two days. 
normally, and in all cases, they're small numbers. So it's not large numbers of people on the farm. These are people with significant support needs in many cases. So they're between one and four people per day on the farm, not large numbers. Um, the farmer supports and works alongside these people and they're involved in the regular, typical farm activities, yard activities, the kitchen activities and in the workshop on the farm. They're obviously safe uh, because the farms are insured and there's assessments of health and safety, but I'll talk about that later. There's always induction for the farmer and the participant before the placement goes ahead. So who takes part and benefits from this? Well, we have quite a lot of people who are in recovery from mental ill health, uh, from significant uh, mental health to just improving their wellness. So a range of people in that. People with disabilities, disabled people with intellectual disabilities, people with Down syndrome, autism, and the range, full range there, physical and sensory disabilities. We have people with wheelchairs have been people who have vision impaired. So there's quite, and people with brain injuries, as you see further down. People who are long-term and employed and looking to examine their options, develop new interests. We've had a number of placements with asylum seekers and refugees. We had two farmers from Syria, actually, who were displaced. Uh, one whose olive grove had been burned. So he, they, they took part in a placement on the farm in Mayo, very successful. It helped them to learn English and to engage with the farming community in the country where they saw refuge. Uh, so we have young people at risk. These are people coming out of the education system, school refusers, uh, people who have been engaged with the justice system, with the, in, in police youth diversion projects and that kind of thing. Older people then, and people with dementia, uh, and people who have been uh, homeless and looking to uh, develop uh, their lives in different ways and also those with addictions. So a wide range of people from about 14 years of age up till their 80s. We operate on the basis of a series of values and principles of what we do. So the key thing is we focus on the inclusion of the individual who will go to the farm. Yes, we focus very much on the farmers, but we're focused on the whole purpose of this is to focus on the individual who comes to the farm and to provide them with useful and valuable service and support. So it's person-centered, it's based on the person's choice to attend and also their choice of goals in what they're doing when they attend. It's commissioned in order that the farmer here in these cases are paid for their time and paid for the resources they put into supporting these people. That may not always be the case, but we're working towards a model where this is commissioned. It's a very valuable support with very good outcomes and benefits for the individuals. And we would like to see the state recognize that and the state services and so pay the farmers for their times, their time. Farmers can obviously negotiate that. Uh, it's safe. There's a very strong focus on safety uh, and covering the risk. It's goal-centered, obviously the person sets goals before they come out. So if they're looking for physical activity to reduce weight, it can be very simple like that, or it can be somebody who says, look, I'm ready to go back to work. I'd like to see, and to build work routines, to build, you know, interests and to see and to build towards that so people who are distant from the workforce would want to go back people who want to look at training it's planned so everything around the placement is planned between the person their advocates or the service that they're coming from and also themselves and the farmer so that things don't necessarily go wrong when they do it can be fixed or addressed very quickly there's a lot of safeguarding built in because people have been taken advantage of as cheap labor on farms before and we have horror stories from the past about that kind of thing. We don't want to see any of that. And we're also engaging with health services who are very cautious about this thing. So safeguarding is very important. Obviously building health and well-being for both farmers, farm families, communities, and for the people who take part. It's a very social activity and it's community-based. It's not clinical. So these people are not being seen by psychiatrists or therapists, it's not therapy. These farmers are not therapists but it's community-based support, which can have significant therapeutic benefits. But again, these are not clinical settings, they're not clinicians, and there's quite a distinction in that. It's flexible in that if somebody cannot turn up till 11 o'clock in the day and have to go by three, that's okay. The flexibility is in the days of the week, in the activities taking place on the farm, so it's set to meet somebody's capacity. 
There's obviously review, regular reviews. And the key thing here is that it's on an ordinary everyday farm. Great. So these are some of the benefits. There's many uh, improvements in health and well-being, physical health. Farmers are quite fit. And many people who go out there realize that very quickly. We have services who go to farms and say, oh my goodness, these farmers, you know, they take you up a hill and down again. And um, so people's physical health can improve significantly. Their diet, uh, they can see how food is produced. And a lot of people, uh, in particularly the younger people that we see coming from the cities onto these social farms, actually engage in food and how food is produced for the first time. They actually understand it and see it on a daily basis. We had young people from Agar that are police diversion project who had never cooked their own food. They were picking up the eggs and making omelets and were amazed, you know, how, how food is produced. So even as we disconnect as a populations from how our food is produced, there is significant benefits there. There's quite significant social connections built between people and the farm, but also in the connections that farms have. Farms are involved in sporting organizations and charitable activities in their community. So there's quite a lot of there. And in many, many cases for everybody that attends these farms, they build skill sampling. They can see and learn quite a lot. We have some people who took up interest say in photography, uh, in cooking, in the kitchen, in preserving. So they develop new interests and skills and obviously a sense of confidence in that that moves can help them move towards other things so the benefits are well known so the activities range hugely from what happens and seasonal change the type and scale of farms we have very large farms and i know jennifer is next uh, she's uh, based one of our social farms based on a large dairy farm in the west and we have very small horticultural units so the scale and size of the farm doesn't really matter it's uh, it's the activities that take place there, the engagements with the community and what happens in a particular day. You can see some of those things there that people do, caring for animals, growing vegetables and fruit, tidying up woodland activities, collecting chopping firewood, moving around the farm, uh, the maintenance on the farm, farm machinery activities, workshop activities, and in the kitchen, uh, in the farm kitchen, preparing their own food, preparing food from each other. Uh, some people uh, take a rota of preparing the food for the groups that are there in particular days. And um, so there's quite a lot of different things happen. Is there a typical farm? These are the network of farms we have. They're right across the country uh, and expanding on the ground. About 120 farms now uh, in place. Uh, so there's a large diversity of farms and farm size, as I said, from one acre up to several hundred acres, right around the type of farm, horticulture, mixed farms, equine, woodland-based activities, dairy farms, tillage farms, there's no typical requirement. And I think the, the real focus is the qualities and characteristics of the farmer themselves and the grower and their family and the community around them. So we see about 25% of these farms that we have are organic certified, um, but they're generally altruistic people involved in a variety of activities in their community as well as farming. We want to provide accessibility nationally for people to access this from the mental health service, disability service, from the education system, from the justice system and other services like homelessness. And, uh, and you can see here some typical activities, uh, uh, planting seeds uh, out of the market. This is a farm in Mayo, Glossary and Holly Mountain Mayo, seven acre organic vegetable farm. So some of the participants go to the market in some cases with these farmers. Um, our growers. So you can see typically, this is an older man here with dementia. He's making jam in the kitchen. He took part in placement on the farm. So there's a wide variety of people doing so many different things uh, and connecting with the community, but also connecting with food, how it's produced and what it means and adding value to those farms in a multifunctional way. So we see social farming as providing new opportunities for people, but also for farmers. These farms are now multi farms providing different unique and innovative support in their own community on their farms without investing hugely uh, the, the value is in the people themselves and in the place that is a farm we're connecting people so connecting people to other people to nature the natural environment to farming to food and to what happens out in the countryside and it all enhances the lives of those who take part we have produced 
quite a number of reports which you can see on our website. I think we have five or six of them now in various sectors in mental health, disability, and it, it researched the activity on farms and presented reports on the outcomes and the benefits. Uh, so we, we, we know it works. We are also involved in a couple of European projects, Erasmus Plus, and just to mention one, so Engage Plus, we're in a second round of funding there, and we are actually engaged with an organization in Romania based in Timisoara. So we have been, I've been on social farms in Romania at this stage and in and these other countries as well, Germany, Spain, Poland. Um, so it is interesting to operate and we're delighted to be associated and input into this project here. But I suppose the key thing from our experience is that ordinary things can happen in ordinary places, but deliver extraordinary results. And that's what we see from social farming and our experience of over 10 years now of engaging in social farming and developing it in Ireland. And it's still really only in the development phase. We're pushing towards mainstreaming uh, with policy change and integration of uh, systems uh, across various government departments to make sure that uh, social farming beds down on farms. So thank you very much. There's, that's a very, very quick whistle stop tour of social farming Ireland and what we're doing in, in that context. There's much more information on the website and you can make contact through those contact details there. So thank you very much. That's great, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, obviously a very important uh, uh, resource for, for people. I think we have a number of questions here, but um, does it, what really stood out to me at that presentation was obviously the people that are engaging in it, you know, people maybe with learning disabilities or have gone through a traumatic time in their life. It's, a, it's almost like a form of therapy. It's obviously very therapeutic for these people to be connecting with nature again. But what really stood out to me was that it's done in a non-clinical setting. And I think that's very interesting because when we think about a lot of healthcare or reintegration services offered through government organizations, it's done in a very, almost like a hospital or clinical rehab. It's all very clinical setting. So this, it's very interesting to hear how it's done in a non-clinical setting. Um, we have just, of course, see someone has a hand up here. Is it? Til, not too sure if pronounce your name, is it Tilburn Anka? Do you want to unmute? So, sorry, you're still on mute, I think. Scuze. Bună ziua, mă numesc Anka Tulbure. Reprezint Universitatea Lucian Blaga din Sibiu, Facultatea de Științe Agricole, Industria Alimentară și Protecția Mediului. Eu predau siguranța și calitatea alimentului și vin către dumneavoastră cu o întrebare din domeniul meu. Am văzut că sunt multe proiecte pentru tineri pe care, care se desfășoară în fermele din Irlanda, dar voiam să vă întreb care este relația cu mediul academic. Sunt studenții implicați în aceste activități? Ați reușit să concretizați parteneriate cu facultățile de profil din Irlanda? Vă mulțumesc foarte mult! Sorry, Brian, did you get that question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, about yeah. the connection with the uh, universities and academia. Yes, certainly. Yes. I mean, from the very beginning, we've linked with the university, particularly University College Dublin, the, the project that we have now arose from a European research project and it involved universities in I think it was seven different countries uh, in which U University College Dublin was involved. Um, and out of that, we built a community of practice looking at, at what was happening in Ireland. And that happened in 2006, I think it was 2007. So I was involved, we had a, a European platform which we, and we did a state of the art for each country. So it's France, Italy, Germany, Slovakia, I think, uh, Ireland. And so we built a community practice out of that locally and also in the European context. In Ireland, we saw what was happening there. We had a series of community gardens. We had a lot of institutional settings in healthcare, which had say a horticultural element, a polytunnel. And we looked then at moving uh, out to what was happening, say, in the Netherlands, where, where farming is much more, uh, care farming was much more developed. And that happened through the university in um, Wanigan University. So we have continued the relationships with those institutions in the European context. 
And one of our projects at the moment is looking at producing training material. The other Erasmus project is working with Czech University, University in South uh, Bohemia, I think it is, and uh, in Germany, and also Vanagen University, Marian Ellings there, to produce some material for students in the occupational therapy and social services. So we are actually engaged uh, with those universities in that project, but also locally in Ireland, we moved from that first research project then to develop a practical pilot with the Interreg funding and we engage with Queen's University in Belfast. So everything we've done to date has been tied to the universities. We've just recently submitted an application to do a piece of clinical research with the uh, Institute of Technology in Letterkenny and occupational therapy students looking at the benefits on social farms in Ireland. So it's vital that we keep that link uh, with, uh, with the universities and we make presentations to students in the occupational therapy, social sciences and rural development in about four or five Irish universities on a yearly basis. Our staff go in and talk to them about social farming and what it's like and how we see it develop in future so that they can build it into the professional practice when they come out. So the answer is yes, very much so. That's great, Brian. Thank you very much. And suppose we all know that social farming has a big impact uh, on a lot of individual lives and stuff, and people needing help. And obviously the work with university will hopefully help uh, measure that and add some metrics to it. Um, the, I think we'll maybe move on to Jennifer, if that's okay, just conscious of the time, and we'll, we will have more time for questions at the end. Uh, Jennifer, are you okay to share your screen, or do you want me to share it? Yeah, I can share it here now, yeah. Okay, thank you. It's not the fastest computer, sorry. It takes a minute. <laughs> no problem. We can see your screen now, yeah. You can see that now, yeah. Yeah. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Payne and um, I'm just going to follow on from what Brian sort of told us about social farming here in Ireland. Um, so we run hilltop dairies and we're in uh, County Roscommon uh, towards the west. Uh, we're actually bordering two different um, of the social farming areas. So we're working with two different uh, people there. Um, but it's myself and my husband Ed, you can see him there with horses. He hates horses by the way, that's a terrible picture for him. But um, and we have two young boys, Aaron and Ben. Aaron is turning five and Ben is nine. Um, and we started social farming in 2018. I went through all the training. Um, we did health and safety uh, checks around the farm. And it's really invaluable as a farmer. Um, we learned an awful lot. Uh, and it also makes you double rethink whether you actually want to be doing this or not and what kind of uh, farm you are and whether social farming will fit. Um, I found social farming, um, I, since I moved to Ireland about 10 years ago, um, I've, been, <laughs> I've been given the chance and the opportunity to do what I, we feel passionate about, which is fantastic. Uh, and being on the farm has allowed me to do that. Um, I did some animal assisted therapy work um, and actually since starting social farming I've bought sensory me which is in Roscommon town it's sensory room so I work a lot with people with disabilities um, and I suppose it's a passion of mine that I found uh, from from doing this so uh, that's that's where I'm coming from um, I take responsibility for social farming on our farm um, we we have a big farm, Brian mentioned uh, we're probably one of the bigger social farmers uh, in the country um, but I make sure that I'm available for social farming and we do it one day a week uh, at the minute anyway. Um, so we don't just have cows, we have horses, alpacas, chickens, cats, dogs, horses, uh, and some lambs there as well now. So, and you wouldn't know what might appear on the farm. It could be anything, anytime. Uh, and we also open our farm up uh, into the community uh, to schools and we have open days and things like that. So that's just a bit about the farm. We are a spring carving and grass based system. Uh, we milk over 500 cows, but that's over two farms. We have one here and one 10 miles down the road. Uh, we do social farming just on the farm here. Uh, we have the house uh, and four acres and then uh, the dairy farm opposite. So it gives us a lot of opportunities to do uh, different activities uh, and also um, 
we, there's a milking parlor with 33 units in it and 320 cows. It's a big enterprise. It's a big thing for someone to walk into. So we kind of start off at the house and the smaller animals maybe, and we work up towards that. Like Brian was saying, we set goals and we set targets and we move towards them. We don't just land people in a parlor and milk 300 cows as they're going. Like we, we take our time. And that's why I dedicate myself to that. Um, but a huge part of it was for us is that all the family involved. Um, we have three full-time staff and quite a lot of the year, quite a lot of uh, part-time staff and students as well. Um, and, and it's part of the whole social thing uh, of social farming is that everyone is involved. We all sit around and we all drink an awful lot of tea. There is a lot of tea drunk and a lot of biscuits eaten um, in between doing some bits of work as well sometimes. So. Um, so I suppose our social farming experience, um, we've been hosting one participant um, since the beginning. Um, and I know we, Brian was saying that the, the, it's usually 10 to 20 weeks. Uh, so our participant comes on the 12 week placement, but it's been recurring. Um, his goals are long term goals um, and it suits him. Um, Deirdre is on the call here as well, I think now. And uh, we have three more participants uh, starting hopefully very soon. Um, their goals may be completely different um, and we're going to work together. So there'll be four people come in at uh, one time and that would be the most we'd take. Uh, they are coming with carers, but it is really important for me that we are focusing on their long term goals. Um, so things like this participant here now we're saying about the milking. He wasn't able to walk on grass when he came here um, he's been living in a house with other people um, and goes to walk on concrete and it's something we kind of don't think about sometimes is that you're not able to walk on grass you've never had to do it or walk through the mud so that was our first goal um, and then we've we've built up we've fed the animals we've worked with the animals uh, we bring the cows in for milking and he actually milks the cows uh, with us now and he's very very capable um, he has an intellectual disability and he is non-verbal. He absolutely loves the animals. Now, some days he won't do anything <laughs> and he prefers to supervise, but that's what we work with and it's fine. Uh, we go at his speed, um, which sometimes is actually really fast and we get way more done. Um, I plan all the activities out, but sometimes we get through all of them really quickly. Uh, and some days we hardly do any because we all have good days and bad days. And it could be me sometimes that's causing that. Um, we have open days. We've had a social farm and open day here. So we invited uh, everyone locally to come and see the farm and learn more about social farming. Um, again, the, our farm might not be the right farm for them, but it's to open their eyes to, to social farming and let them engage uh, with what, what they can do. Um, there are so many different farms and it's an amazing thing that people with half an acre um, and the vegetable patch, anything like that can get involved to big farms as well. Um, we like to put the social into social farming, as I say. So we host discussion groups here. Um, we're always wanting to learn. We always want to um, get knowledge from other people. So we have a lot of groups who do visit the farm. And this is um, our participant joining in one of the groups um, there. So it's really the social element is very important to people. Um, and it's also um, engaging the community as well in this. Um, some of the things we do, there's walk on the farm. We do a lot of walking. <laughs> and Brian, you were saying as well um, about going up a hill. <laughs> we get that a lot. There's a hill up to the farm, we're called Hilltop. And to us, we don't really feel it. But I know um, some people come out from the town and they're like, get to the top of the hill. And it's a long way <laughs> for them. So you, you, you forget how fit you actually do to become farming. Um, as well as social farming, um, I'm very passionate that we engage uh, in the community. Um, I've seen it a lot. We know that even from the small school children, um, they don't know where their food comes from. Uh, the, the milk comes from a supermarket. And we're talking about people who live in a village. We live in a village and their parents, their grandparents would have farmed. And the children, they're just they're not understanding where their food comes from. So I find it really, really important. So you can see here, we've had um, school groups. We have them from the creche. So they come from when they're three years old. And then we, we follow through with all local uh, schools and also the schools in town. And I think it's really important that the schools in the town are very involved and they get to come out. 
And then we also work with, um, it's usually agricultural colleges, but other colleges as well. Um, and it's been really amazing that we have students who have come and visited the farm on one of these days, who then want to come and work with us. Um, and we've had one or two um, who have visited the farm. One lad came, visited the farm. He did his placement here and he's worked with us for the past eight years since. Uh, we've actually sent him off to another farm because um, it's fantastic that he's worked with us. He needs to get experience elsewhere as well. Um, it's very important. Uh, and the bottom picture there is just is a fundraising open day that we held here. Um, and it was just fantastic. We had uh, about 300, 400 people visit the farm on a really, really rubbish day. It was raining, so everything had to come inside. Um, but it's just about involving the community, getting them to know where their food comes from, getting them to ask questions, getting to see the cows, milk the cows. Um, and then um, we also, oh, sorry, there, um, the milk lorry, we involve a Revo, we supply a Revo co-op. Um, and I know a lot of it, maybe the older groups, they come to the farm, they see how we, um, milk the cows, how we measure the grass, how we keep the grass in front of them. Um, grass is our big, big thing here. Um, and then we involve the co-op, so they get to see the milk going on the lorry because he comes most days. And then um, some of them have actually gone down uh, to Arivo uh, to the, see the process in and see where the milk is going to. Um, ours would be high constituents, we'd have high protein, high fat. Uh, and it would be made into butter and uh, into milk powder. Um, but there are other, other farms locally who would go into to producing the milk uh, as well. So they get to see the whole process and understand uh, what's going into it. Now, it's not a short food chain. Um, I would love to have a vending machine here. Um, a, lot, a lot of my friends have done it, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem viable at the minute because of we're quite a rural location and we, we do have the main Dublin road uh, just two minutes away, but they're about to bypass that. So uh, economically, we're not sure it's going to be completely viable, but it, but it is in my sights to, to shorten the food chain just a little bit at some point and, and have vending machines. Um, but that's one of my big ideas that I have a lot of the time. So um, that's our story and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, that's great, Jennifer. Thank you so much for that there. Um, very impressive what you do, especially when you have over 500 cows to milk every day. I don't know how you manage the time. I know I have, we have a, a neighbour here in Donegal who is also a dairy farmer and they're, you see them on the road at six in the morning and they're still out at midnight <laughs> driving tractors. At midnight now, we'd be very strict on um, having a work-life balance for everybody. Yes, that, and yeah. And I th <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and I was going to say, I think that's an ongoing challenge for a lot of people, uh, for farmers, is getting that life-work balance, you know. So it's very impressive how you fit in all this um, time to show the farm and how it works to other people and pass on the skills and give them the opportunity. So it's very impressive how you do that. Um, just want to check, does anybody have any questions for Jennifer? Um, and if not, we can, does anyone, if anyone wants to raise their hand? Just while you're waiting, Patrick, we do, we are very engaged with the Chagas, the National uh, Farm Advisory and Farm Support Body as well. We have engaged with them quite a significant bit over the years and continue to do so, particularly with relation to farm, farmer training and moving that into the mainstream with social farming training. So, uh, and it yeah. follows from the last question. Yeah, I see. And I see Joe Kelleher, I think, from uh, Chagas is on the call here as well. So, um, no, and, that, it, and Elaine, Elaine Levy, there is one of the other Elaine Levy. advisors. I see her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I suppose maybe again, this is not my area of expertise, but they're looking at the more the EU policy and the reform and cap and stuff. It, it looks like we're going maybe towards uh, there's a, there's definitely a focus on sustainability and the amount we're producing food, and it's, there's there's going to be changes I think across the board in terms of um, how things are done. I know a lot of most farm a lot of farms have already embraced that, um, so there's definitely a lot of changes um, going to take place. But it's very impressive that. Um, these farms are able to um, give a social good as well as just running a profitable business. Um, so it's very impressive. Uh, I think we'll maybe move on to Louise. I'm just conscious of the time and we will have 10 minutes at the end uh, for Q&A. 
Louise, are you able to share your screen or do you want me to share yeah, yours? Yeah, um, I should be able to share it. So I'll try it. Yeah. So Louise is from Irish Rural Link. And again, I think she can explain. Um, you've, you're involved in a, lots of different initiatives, but um, in terms of so working with social enterprises, but also in the food chain as well. So I'll let Louise explain what she does. Yeah. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah perfect. perfect. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, as Patrick said, I'm, I'm, my name is Louise Lennon um, and I work with Irish Roar Link. I'm the policy and communications officer with Irish Roar Link. Um, so uh, this morning, I'll just give a brief overview of the what work Irish Roar Link are involved in and some of the initiatives um, we work with. As Patrick said that we work with a lot of community groups um, social enterprises as well but we also have a few eu projects um working in um rural development and um creating jobs and growth in rural areas um, so just a bit about irish rural link we were founded in 1991 and we're a national organization representing the interests interests of locally based rural groups in disadvantaged and marginalized rural areas um, we have about 600 members um, I suppose our, our core work is, is advocating and negotiating rural proof policies um, and we engage with a lot of uh, government departments um, representing uh, the voice of rural people and rural communities. Um, we sit on a, on a number of government committees also we were we sat on the previous the previous rural development um, action plan monitoring committee um, we're involved with the peakland council inland fisheries and um, the different cross-border programs and um, would have been involved in the steering group of the new peace plus um, program and um, we're members of the community and voluntary pillar and the just transition retrofit steering group also um, so our vision is of vibrant, inclusive and sustainable rural communities that contribute to an equitable and just society. And our mission is to influence and inform local, regional, national and European development policies and programmes in favour of rural communities, especially those who are marginalised as a result of poverty and social exclusion in rural areas. So, as I mentioned, we're one of 17 national organizations um, that constitute the community and voluntary pillar. Um, and a, a lot this, this is a lot of our core work. Um, so uh, the members um, of the community and voluntary pillar, we represent children, um, unemployed, disability, uh, community and social justice, older people and rural communities as well as housing also. So this social dialogue, it gives IRL um, rights to represent rural issues, direct government and helps direct and shape government policy for the most vulnerable in society. So some of the current programs and projects we're involved in um, on a national level, um, we're the lead partner in the National Rural Network, um, which raises awareness of the Rural Development Programme, um, which is part of Pillar 2 of the Common Agricultural Policy. Um, so we communicate best practice examples, opportunities and outcomes to all relevant stakeholders. Um, while the the program has been extended because the rural development program has been extended also so we'll be continuing on with this work until the new cap is is published uh, we're also involved with the delivery of uh, getting citizens online and it skills for farmers which are um they're funded through the department of uh, environment climate and um, communications uh, helping people to to get online, um, especially those who you know who have never used a computer before, and um, so we work with them in, in improving their computer literacy and developing um, emails with them, and doing online banking and other um, 
online government government services that have moved online, like motor tax, um, accessing social welfare, um, and also look at internet search. Um, I suppose during COVID as well, it became very important for a lot of older people, especially to to keep in touch. So um, a lot of our tutors set up um, like a buddy style system to work with those um, who either had never used um, computers before, but have our, our the were previous um, participants in the program and just to help them set up Zoom calls and, you know, so they could keep in touch with their family and neighbors. Um, so the, the program, it's, it's a short program. It runs for five weeks for, with two hours classes per week. And we've over 6,000 people have gone through the program. Um, the IT skills for farmers um, is getting more farmers online, I suppose, um, with, again, the, the, the blue book has been, has, been, um, has been ended and just to help, help them to register their, their calves and herd registration and, and, and herd movements. Um, and then as well, we covered the other basic skills as well. So some of the European projects um, we we currently involved in there's three currently active and there's three of them that were previous um, they've finished in the last year. Um, so the one I suppose that's more relevant to this is is the Robismo project. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. We also delivered Delsa again. It was uh, um, improving the digital skills of um, adult, adults, um, even uh, those, including those which, who are unemployed. Um, so that, that, that finished up in December last year, but the, the, the training courses that were developed as part of the program is still, is still available on the, the website. Um, I don't know, it, it, the website there is digitaldelta.eu. And um, DEAL is a new Erasmus Plus project we're involved in. Again, it is enhancing the digital skills of, of entrepreneurs. Um, and we, we kind of focus more on the micro, the micro and self-employed um, entrepreneurs. Um, Niche is um, a current project as well. It began last December, and that's lo looking at the um, cultural and heritage sector, especially the intangible and our living heritage, um, the, the, that sector, and developing um, tools and, and training courses to, to support those involved in the sector. And sustain it was an Rasmus Plus project as well that looked at um, sustainable tourism in rural areas, um, and that was fin that finished up last year as well, last December. Um, but is still the training course is still involved, uh, still available on on the website. So I suppose Robismo um, is is it's. A, as I said, it's probably the, the more relevant one for, for this workshop um, and it's replicable business models for modern rural economies. Um, it's funded, um, it's a Horizon 2020 project and um, it's a um, three-year project. So it's due to start in 2018 and due to finish um, at the end of our October of this year. Um, so there's 16 partners across 11 EU countries. So we have partners in Germany, uh, France, Spain, Sweden, Denmark, um, Romania, Poland. Um, and the website is there, robismo.eu, and follow on Twitter as well, at Robismo. So I suppose the main aim of, of the Robismo project is to identify, um, I suppose, the vital components uh, for developing entrepreneurship of, uh, across the three sectors. So we look at food and um, agriculture, uh, bio-based value chains and ecosystem services. So that would include tourism, um, conservation projects, 
um, social farming as well would would come in into that. And we have some case studies of social farming in in some of the other countries. So um, as part of the project, we've developed tools um, that um, to support um, support those involved in rural uh, rural enterprise. So it, it covers the, the entrepreneur, um, but also uh, support actors as well and policymakers um, and investors that, that make up, I suppose, the, the stakeholders of rural enterprise. So we have we've developed four tools and we're also developing um, developing training um, some training courses that would be access, accessible online. Um, the virtual library um, is, is the first tool that we developed and we looked at it's a, a library of business models and business cases across the three sectors of the food bio-based value chain and ecosystem services across the 11 EU countries involved in, in the sector are in the project. Um, so it goes through um, the, the business idea, where the idea came from, the history of the business, but also looks at what supports they accessed in their local area. So like their local development company or leader, the access leader funding, um, access, you know, other, I suppose the local enterprise offices as well. Um, and what challenges they faced also and how they overcame some of those challenges. So I suppose um, this one very much aimed at the entrepreneur if they, they want to go on and, and just read up about cases and even to give ideas to people if, if they're thinking of setting up a, a rural business. The transformation support tool is, um, again, it's, it's, it's aimed at entrepreneurs, but also for those, you know, support actors such as, you know, the um, agri-advisors um, and other business advisors as well. Um, just if people are looking to, to change their business model, so I suppose um, um, Patrick had mentioned there the farm to fork strategy and, and the increased, increased targets for organic farming. So if you were a food producer and wanted then to go um, maybe change over to organic, um, this tool is available that you can um, read up on, on some case studies as well that, that are available, but how you could go about, um, you know, making that, that transformation and seeing what, what, what you need, need to do um, to, to get there. Uh, the cooperation toolkit, sorry, um, cooperation toolkit are it's also a network tool. Um, it has a has a library again of, of different networks across Europe, um, and there's also the um, um, the opportunity you can add networks if if you have a network that that you think would be suitable to um, include here. Um, you, you're able to add your network to it, um, and, a, and for if entrepreneurs wanted to join networks um, in other EU with uh, with other EU countries as well, um, and again, there's also uh, guidelines as well available that will support or help you to to set up or establish a um, a network. Um, the the training then, and it'll be there'll be an e-learning platform, and um, it'll involve different um, different courses. You know, PowerPoint mainly PowerPoint presentations, but that entrepreneurs or anyone accessing it, or those that are training entrepreneurs also, um, can use it. I suppose to support their current work, or you know, dip in and out of it. It's 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 available there for use it's free so um you can it might support some of the work that you're already delivering um so we also we use the business model canvas um i suppose it helps to collect and better understand 
and communicate the ingredients that that are vital to transform a, a business model into a, a sustainable and viable venture for entrepreneurs. Um, but also the entrepreneur can use it to, I suppose, identify their strengths and weaknesses and see where they can have, where, where there is potential for them to grow their business. Um, that, that will be available on the training platform as well. And, and um, training guides will be included in that. So I suppose there's, um, we've just a, less than six months left in the project, but we're still um, a few bits to finish. We're finalizing a business tool, business tool too. So this is a supportive business environment tool. And it will look, at, it's mainly aimed at policymakers and um, looking at, you know, what are the, what is needed for a successful business environment, but also um, the tool will allow you to identify where you're at at the moment but, and where you want to be or where you need to be so that um, you can provide that environment for rural businesses to, to develop. Uh, we, um, we deliver cafe talks. Since last November, we moved um, these online. Um, so we're in cycle seven at the moment. Um, they're held every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. for they're for about a half an hour. It's very casual. It's a 15 minute, 10, 15 minute presentation and then 15 minute discussion. Um, and we have had um, the last three months now, we've had longer um, virtual tours of business cases. So we have one coming up on the 22nd and it's um, Macaulay Wood Fuels is involved in that one from Leitrim. So um, there's details on the website um, about those, those cafe talks. Um, we're also delivering training of entrepreneurs and trainers, and we're in the process of, of setting up a European project summer school. So we're collaborating with other Horizon 2020 projects um, to look at the tools that are available in these projects that are, will be available um, for the take up by entrepreneurs, but also policymakers and um, ed trainers and educators. So um, then if, if people are interested, we will look at, at delivering training on these tools in more detail. So some of the, another initiative that's relevant for today's workshop is the National Meals and Wheels Network. Um, so Irish Rural Inc, um, we encourage our various members to form single issue networks. So as I said, we have the National Meals and Wheels. We have 300, about 300 organizations um, delivering approximately 40,000 meals per week. Um, I, I can say that's probably a lot higher now um, given the recent events, but um, it, it's helping people to stay in their own home and um, and we also have community wetlands forum which is about 25 groups managing and developing community peatland amenities so the meals and wheels network we established it in 2015 um, it came from some of our members that were delivering meals and wheels to to form a network that you know to to provide you know that we so they would have greater support, I suppose, in the delivery of the service. So the vision is for a fully supported meals and meal system, providing community-led services dedicated to meeting the nutritional and social needs of older and vulnerable people to enable them live independently. So there has definitely been a greater need for this service. And, um, you know, meals and meals has been around for a lot of years, like in some of the the our members you know they've been they were set up in the 60s and, and 70s but um the need for the service is still um as great today um and i suppose a lot of the time there is sometimes that stigma attached to it that it is for um you know that older people might have that you know that what would people the neighbors think if i can't can't cook my own meal, I'm getting the meals delivered, but um, it's, 
we're trying to remove that stigma and build it into, I suppose, the the whole um, care for older people in, in the communities. Um, and I suppose with an aging population, there is, even before COVID, the demand for the service was increasing. Um, I suppose the Slauncha Care um, framework as well is focusing more on that delivery of healthcare in, in the communities. And like we would see Meals on Wheels having a, a greater role to play in, in supporting that delivery. Um, also COVID-19 with people not being able, especially the first lockdown when people were cocooning, a lot of the daycare centers were um, closed. So um, a lot of the groups did, did set up Meals on Wheels as well and, and, and changed their model to deliver um, meals to people in their own homes. Um, so the objectives of the net network is to advocate for a national standardized Meals on Wheels service. So there, there's a lot of, you know, there's groups that have been established for a very long time. There's newer groups, you know, delivering on smaller scale. Um, and I suppose supporting them to help help develop their 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 service um, and working in that kind of like a, a, the peer to peer you know knowledge you know and, and the sharing of information the the network allows for that to take place and um, also as well like groups the the funding that they only receive annual funding from the HSC so. Um, looking at kind of better funding structures for for the service as well um, and so that they can budget long term and I suppose COVID really impacted on Meals and Meals Network and um, you know their reliance on fundraising the reliance on um, you know extra income coming in you know some might um, do extra you know rent out rooms and all that income was lost during COVID um, and then again, you know, they were only getting the annual funding. So a lot of them nearly had their funding nearly ran out, you know, by the first few weeks of lockdown back in March 2020. So um, trying to get secure, stronger funding or core funding for, for these groups as well. Um, again, I can add, we advise and advocate the government and other agencies. So we've kind of worked working closer now with um, with the HSC since COVID, they've kind of recognised, you know, the value that the service has for people um, living in their own homes. Um, and the network to help meet the future demands of network members by assisting in development of their services. Um, so I suppose some of the current work we're involved in, we're finalising the new website, um, which we hope to launch um, this summer. Um, we been currently doing a mapping exercise of the Meals on Wheels services across the country. Um, this was mainly to help identify gaps in services, um, but also, like I suppose, since COVID as well, a lot of new groups have um, popped up. So I suppose, um, you know, see if there are overlaps um, and, you know, if, if groups could work together, you know, um, and also, if there are gaps near other services that they could link in with each other and see who could deliver to, to that area. If people had capacities or if they could split it maybe one one day and another another day of the week. Um, and also as well to make it easier um, for people to find a service. I mean, we get calls and emails from family members in, living in America or um, Australia that they're you know they're away from their family that they're they're concerned about their you know their health as well or you know to make it easier for them they're no longer they might be coming out of hospital just to ensure that they have that um, service available for them so again this will help them to identify or, or find a service in their area um, we're also doing a needs analysis um, of the service. So this is to highlight the demand for the service, um, which was increasing before COVID anyway, but um, definitely COVID has 
um, had a big impact on providers in terms of demand and, as I said, the funding as well. Um, um, we were also able to secure community foundation funding in 2020 and 2021 to distribute among the means and means providers. So this, I suppose, made it easier for the community foundation to um, deliver it out to, the, to distribute it to the, the different groups as well. Um, so I suppose the network as well will help, you know, volunteering was a big issue as well for um, groups during COVID. Um, like a lot of their volunteers would be older people and a lot of them did have to end up cocooning themselves during um, lockdown. So, and, you know, some are nervous about going back back to um, volunteering as well. So I suppose working with Volunteer Ireland um, to access, um, you know, to, to be able to access the volunteers and work with kind of helping them get volunteers. And also working with, um, I know Food Cloud are coming up um, in, in the next few minutes, but working with them as well. And, and a lot of the, the, a lot of the groups would work with um, Food Cloud in accessing food and again it, it, it just helps with that reduction in food waste and I suppose sourcing more locally produced um, products as well um, and you know keeping the, the ben other benefits that, that comes with that also. So thank you for listening and um, if anyone wants more information on any of the projects or the needles and wheels my email is louise at irishroarlink.ie and thank you again. Louise, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting to hear about the Meals and Wheels service. And, you know, it's been around for a long time, but it's obviously, I think people uh, had, a, appreciate, had a renewed appreciation for it last year during COVID, obviously, because people maybe weren't able to travel or they're cocooning. And, but one thing I noticed from the Meals and Wheels, it's not only produce, or providing like a nutritional hot meal for people, but I think a lot of people living on their own, um, they have suffer from loneliness, and obviously it's an opportunity for them uh, to they look for it's something they can build their day around and look forward to people, someone coming with a meal and having it, even just having a chat. So yeah, it's a very valuable service. Um, and just on the Rebismo project as well, I did sit in one of the cafe talks. It was really really good, and uh, it I must I think hopefully we'll be able to share some of the resources in terms of. Is there a Bismo do so? I'm assuming businesses want to avail of the resources and learning. Do they sign up on the website or how do they? Is it open to everyone or just a select group of stakeholders? No, it's it's open to everyone. So um, I suppose that the, we're at present developing the training platform and um, we will, Irish Shore Link will be delivering training as part of the project ourselves to any uh, partners interested so our stakeholders that are interested so um if people wanted to contact us um but when we, we have dates set for that we will be um advertise you know putting it on our website putting it on social media as well um as i mentioned there the summer school um is we're, we're Develop, are working at that we're hoping to get that set up by um have it for three weeks in um the end of june and the first two weeks of july just to see what the the, the taste like kind of a taste for it and if it's successful we'll look continuing it again in september and um, so that that will look at it'll give people to come in and kind of look at the tools and give them a bit of a test in them but then if if they want to you know have deeper training in it then we deliver training as well on it okay that's great well, and we'll share the details with everyone afterwards yeah, that's great Louise I really appreciate that um this is very good um I will move, move on to Connor Daly now from Food Cloud I'm just conscious of the time and we'll, we'll have uh, five or ten minutes at the end for uh, a quick Q and A. Um, so yeah, Connor's from Food Cloud was mentioned a number of times uh, initially, and he can explain it better than me. 
So, if, uh, Connor, do you want to? Are you able to share your screen, or do you want me to share your presentation? If, if you don't mind, Patrick, uh, yeah, be great. And uh, just to say, uh, I'm I'm not actually I work with Food Cloud, so I'm not currently with them. But I, okay. you know, I, I'll talk about Food Cloud, what we did there, and then uh, I'll I'll go through the deck. Yeah, just give me two seconds to open up the presentation here. Can you see everyone see the presentation there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Connor, you just let me know when move to the next slide or whatever. Yeah, perfect. Uh firstly, uh Patrick, thanks for the invitation. Uh and from the regional assembly. Uh um, I know Patrick from a previous project called the Niche Project when we worked together up in Donegal and it was involved in the honey and uh, Romania uh, was one of the countries involved. So uh, Doris, I've been out there and beautiful Timisoara and also Trunde, nice to meet you from Hungary. Uh, uh, just before I go on, just pay tribute to um, Joanne, Brian, Jennifer and Louise, uh, super work that you're doing. Um, well, you guys have spoke a lot about the social, maybe I could come in and talk more about the same sustainability. And when I talk about sustainability, I'm probably talking about economic sustainability, a living wage and fair prices and uh, environmental sustainability. So if I kick off with Food Cloud, um, Food Cloud is uh, an amazing company. I worked there uh, for the last year, up until the uh, February this year. It was set up by two young women, uh, Isolt and Even, uh, where they, they met at college, and they've created this amazing uh, company. And what they do is probably three things. Um, they've created a technology app which allowed supermarkets to identify surplus food or food that they don't think is going to sell, to, to sell. And rather than throw that food into waste or landfill, um, they can upload that information into their app. And then they've got a network of charities here in Ireland that actually can access that app and they can collect the food. So you have supermarkets. Uh, and when I say supermarkets, you're talking about Tesco, Lidl, Aldi, uh, Spar, Super Value, um, basically loading every day uh, into this app food that they don't think is going to sell. And then local charities in that area can collect um, that food. Um, the benefit for the, the, the supermarkets is that they um, th it reduces their cost of um, disposing of the waste, but also allows them the marketing and the branding to say that they are supporting charities in the local areas um, by working with the charities they're ensuring that the food goes to the right people the most vulnerable people so um when louise was talking there about elderly meals on wheels you know children uh people uh, who, who are literally hungry and uh, those charities are working so it, it, it it's a, a wonderful business um the other thing they have in ireland is they have three warehouses so they have a warehouse in dublin where i was based and we also they also had to have a warehouse in cork and galway and how that works then is that you have the big supermarkets have central distribution depots and if they find that they have produce that is going out of date or they know that won't sell, they can ship that in to the food cloud depots. And then the food cloud have bands on the road, which basically deliver that surplus food into charities. Um, so it's, a, it, it's an amazing system. Uh, they also have a very interesting idea around volunteering. So big corporate companies, for example, there's a big bank here in Ireland called Allied Irish Bank. They would have partnered with Food Cloud and they have sent in volunteers from AIB to actually work doing the picking and the fulfillment of the orders in the warehouses and helping out the vans and the distribution. So you now have basically employees with a big organization who are paid by that organization to get time off to volunteer doing social good uh, with Food Cloud. And AIB, for example, would be just one company 
And then for the likes of AIB, it's good for their staff morale. And it's also good for them to say, we are supporting uh, charities. We are supporting uh, sustainability. So it, it meets their CSR uh, requirements. So again, it was a, it's a relatively young company. Um, just to, to say they, they have operations in the UK and Poland, the Czech Republic, they have uh, apps that uh, people can use. So at the end, if, if anybody wants information on how they can connect in with Food Cloud, uh, I'm happy to facilitate that. Um, I, I had a great year there, and uh, I'll talk about what I'm doing now. And if you can go to the next slide, uh, Patrick, that would be great. Thank you. So the sort of thing with food waste and plastic and uh i just want to touch on this because th th there's a huge issue with, with sustainability and the amount of plastic that's end up in our oceans and landfill and can't be recycled and there you have uh some stats from europe and ireland is the worst and if i pay tribute to hungary and romania you guys are down at the bottom right so uh maybe we could learn some uh ideas from hungary and uh romania on how we could be more efficient but ireland is the worst and now this is 2016 figures um the problem though with plastic the plastics are very important for preserving the shelf life of food so without plastics or proper proper packaging a lot of food will go into waste. So it's like, how do we square that circle? And um, if we go on to the next slide, uh, Patrick, where, where my thinking is, I'm, I'm actually doing a, a master's in food management and technology uh, with TU Dublin here. And where it's going is, this is my personal opinion, but the research is that if you look at uh, non-biodegradable, -bi biodegradable, bio-based, fossil fuel-based, that top right-hand corner is where all the research and the marketing is going. So my thinking is that if we look at food and we look at supply chains and we look at sustainability, we have to look at packaging and shortening supply chains because that extends the shelf life and the, the freshness and uh, you know the, the wonderful things you get in food. Um, so we're now moving towards bioplastics and where you actually can put your plastics in the bin. And it's really, so that's where it's going. And um, as I say, I'm doing some research there on that as part of the masters. Uh, can I go on to the next slide, Patrick, please? Okay, link to that then is just touching on the consumer. So the consumer just doesn't want to know about sustainability. They want to know where the food comes from, the price. They want to know everything. Okay, so we're now moving to digitization. And if you are developing your supply chain, it's how do you capture all this information for like, uh, what's there, uh, you know, tell me about the air, the air miles. How far did it come from? Who's the local uh, farmer? Do they use pesticides? Are they organic? Um, are they involved in the community? Do they pay a fair wages to their employees? Um, you know, what are they, how do the animal husbandry you know, rate? So all this information now is going to be so important in terms of marketing and positioning food products. And I think it's also got to shorten the supply chains because to control that information, you have to shorten the supply chains. And um, so if we go on to the next slide, I think digitization and transparency. And it's also got, there's a lot of legal stuff coming in here. So if we start with the EU and the laws coming down, they're saying, look, at, we need quality assurance for health and safety. So there's maximum residue levels come, uh, regulations and you have to comply with those. And you have to prove that you can comply with those. And then you have to traceability because there's different uh, food standards. Europe is probably blessed that we have the highest food standards in the world. So if we look at honey, a lot of honey is coming from China or Asia into Europe. It's landed at one euro 50 a kilo, I think. And European beekeepers can't produce honey until 250 a kilo. So we ended up with blended honey products. So in Ireland, if I pick up a jar of honey, it says a blend of EU and non-EU honey. And a blend can be 1% European honey and 99% Chinese honey. And because it's cheaper to bring in products from Asia than produce in Europe, the prices of honey is staying low for the beekeepers in say Romania or Bulgaria, or Poland or Spain or Italy, Portugal, so that those sustainability of their, those livelihoods are under uh, under threat. So 
you then move into the sustainability goals to so all the big multinationals. And this has happened, you know, they're saying, we need to look at our carbon footprint. And there's leaders out there like Danone, and they're saying, we got to measure this and we got to reduce it down. So they will only want to be working in the future with companies and producers that actually can demonstrate that they are reducing their carbon footprint. They are looking after their water and their soil and different things like that. Um, you then bring that down to brands and consumers and confidence and trust. And basically, that's where that digitization piece comes in. So consumers are voting with their wallets and they're saying, I can now determine what I want to buy. So if I want uh, uh, a fair trade coffee or, you know, whatever it is, I, I'm going to buy from the brands and the companies that match my ethos and my um, uh my view of the world and in the past marketing probably they could talk to talk but now they're having to walk the walk and with technology if you're not doing what you're saying on your packaging and your marketing you'll be called out pretty quickly um and that's a huge issue for brands um i don't know if any of you seen the nestle report there but i think uh issue that's saying that the amount of sugar and salt and i think uh in their products is a serious issue um, and they have to, you know, how do they deal with this? Because this information is becoming uh, more and more important. And at the end of the day, it's about profitability, because if our farmers and our food producers are not making a living wage, then they can't stay in business. And uh, so, you know, it's so important that uh, we reward the producers. And if most of the profitability and the, the, the profit has been taken you know, in the supply chain closest to the consumer, I would argue that it's more important for the brands and the consumers to actually engage more with the profitability are, are the local farmers. And you, you, you saw what Joanne was doing there up in Donegal, you know, reaching out um, and Jennifer there in Roscommon and, you know, the work that Brian's doing in Leitrim. So it's more about connecting people in, but also when you do that, you, you get rid of what we call the med messy middle in the supply chain and it's more revenue goes to the people who are doing the work um so i'm just going to share so an organization i'm involved in it's a it's a dutch company if you can go to the next slide uh it's called fair chain um it's a foundation it's a not-for-profit and the idea was that most of the coffee imported into europe comes in as green beans it's roasted in europe and then sold and a fraction of the money is left in the source country where the coffee beans are produced. So this company called Fairchain, it's a nonprofit foundation, came up with the idea that says we are actually going to roast the coffee in Ethiopia and we're going to bring it in and sell it and we're going to give 50% of the retail value back to the country of origin. So that's how the Fairchain Foundation started and they created this brand called Moy Coffee. And this was their first product. So if you bring all this together, we're talking about economic sustainability. We're talking about environmental sustainability. And we're talking about transparency where the customers can actually track and trace where that coffee is coming from. And the technology platform is built on a blockchain platform, and which basically means that it's you're telling the truth. So you cannot disguise any information. Uh, and it's transparent so anybody who buys from my coffee our fair trade foundation can see where every penny goes on that journey of the coffee being grown in ethiopia and ending up in your uh mug when you drink that coffee next slide please patrick so here is what they're trying to do in fair chain and they've succeeded um so they're upscaling small actors so they're bringing these people together they're enabling them to use technology and building that knowledge and supporting them in the field on the ground and they're shrinking that supply chain you still need the large actors but again it's which actors you choose to work with and again it's like you know more sustainability you know reducing chemicals reducing packaging diversity all those things and they brought that together with the the, the, the moi coffee um they in holland they have this in with albert Heijn, which you may not be familiar with here in ireland uh or, or romania or bulgaria it's it's a huge upmarket uh largest supermarket chain in holland uh they got on the shelves there but they also have a direct to consumer and direct to uh business model 
and which has uh, been wonderful for them. And if I can go to the next slide. Uh, so you take the fair chain model. This is from fair chain Moe coffee that you can buy in Ireland and the UK. And you can actually sign up and get coffee delivered to you once a month. And it's really, really good coffee, guys. So if you want super coffee delivered to your door and you get this well-being feeling and also companies and organizations can get coffee delivered, new coffee machines or whatever. But that's an example of direct to consumer because the money now is staying in the supply chain. So coffee uh, delivered to your door. Um, another example is the... Um, the, thank you, Patrick, is the, a project with cacao from Ecuador. Um, this is a UN, um, let me get this right, uh, it's a UN development program initiative. So they so, so source cacao from uh, Ecuador. It's the most amazing chocolate and they sell it directly. So if you Google the other dot bar, uh, you can buy this directly online. I just want to make a few points here is there's there's an impact here and it's, it's sort of like this sort of let's create impact this is driven at the consumer so you see that qr code that little thing when you scan that on your phone um there yeah thanks patrick uh you could you have three choices you can basically this is a consumer spending i'm buying this bar and now i'm making a choice right so when you go that you get a token and that's a blockchain token that basically says i'm going to give that to the grower of the, the chocolates, the, the people there. So they get a, a tip. It's like you're in a restaurant, you give somebody a tip, but that goes directly to the producer. The other thing they can do and say, you can also use that token to support, say, uh, suppose they're building a water treatment plant or a new school, or there's some NGO in that area, they're planting trees. You can donate to that locality as well, or whatever. Or thirdly, you can say, I'm gonna have a reward for myself. So when I buy my next bar, I got to get a discount, so it's like a loyalty program, and this is what the sort of uh, the the Fairchain Foundation thing is all about. Um, this uh, impact, so consumers making an impact with their spend. Um, so, and if I can go on to the project I'm working with them on now, uh, Patrick. Sorry, you, sorry, you, sorry you, Connor, Yes, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Just uh, we're a bit pressed for time, but yeah. Okay, no, two very, more very slides. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so last two slides is this is the honey thing that I worked on uh, with Niche Project. Um, we have made the decision because we, we, we went all through that actually phase one is where we're going to go. So we're going to go from the producer to the processor to the consumer. Phase one. The other thing, the distribution, the retail, whatever, that doesn't exist anymore. And finally, the last uh, slide, uh, Patrick. So how it works is a honey producer orders a test kit. They sample the honey, they send it, and then we load that information. It's like a digital DNA into a blockchain. And then when the producer has all the honey and they want to ship or whatever, samples are taken into two match. We authenticate that that's a genuine product. And then you sell that direct to the consumer. And the last slide is just a closing slide that's um, unconscious of time. Uh, that's how it looks. Um, there's a video then, Patrick, uh, from Accenture on supply chain and blockchain. If you if you're interested in playing this, it's three minutes long. It's really really good if you've got three minutes. Yeah, right. um, I'm just I'm just conscious of the time, so yeah. um, we're, we're way over. Yeah. But I might just share the 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 YouTube. It's on YouTube. I might just share it as a link afterwards, if that's okay, Connor. Yeah. Thank thanks okay. again for that. That was kind of like an insight into the future. <laughs> I think um, as to what, what what's going down the line. I'm conscious we didn't get um, really time to have any uh, Q&A, and I'm also conscious that we have interpreters um, on here who have, have been <laughs> interpreting for the last uh, nearly two hours, over two hours. <laughs> so uh, do we have any one or two questions that people would like to ask? Or Doris, do you think we have time for questions? Or? Sure, is there any questions? Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask or any observations? I don't think we have any. Uh, I might just put up one or two polls that, um, uh, two seconds, just to see, get an idea that helps us with research um, in terms of, so I don't know if everyone can see this, but the first question is, what is the biggest challenge facing farmers and growers? Um, and if you just want to put in what you think here, terms of fair price for produce, skills for our labour shortages, consumer awareness, inadequate policy, government support, or lack of integration and collaboration in the food chain. 
or maybe it's something else. Just give another couple of seconds to see. Looks like <laughs> I'm just going to share the results in a second. Okay, I think everyone's put in their answer, so I'm just going to end the poll and share the results there. So you can see, I think most people are saying fair price for produce is coming up as one of the biggest challenges, uh, which is quite interesting and it has come up there. And we've, like a lot of the research we have heard, obviously, that growers and farmers do tend to operate on a um, quite a limited profit margin. Um, so it, it is a definitely a challenge. And I think it really comes back to this, to the consumer awareness and that people need to be prepared to pay a higher price for lo lo local produce. And we're probably in a bit spoiled. Um, I'm just gonna share one more poll, or sorry, in terms of very similar question, but this time just with, um, what are the biggest challenges facing social enterprises in the food chain? So, um, so probably thinking everything from community gardens, uh, social farms, right through to when food is actually delivered to the consumer and things like the meals and wheels service um, that Louise mentioned. And it was also the intermediaries in between as well. Okay, I think has everyone got their response and I'm just gonna end the poll now. So interestingly, the biggest one there was long-term financial uh, stability, which is interesting. We had suspected that we'd done our um, research, um, but it's good to get to see it's kind of a clear answer. Interestingly, skill shortages didn't um, come through there. So that was quite interesting. I thought there would have been a bit of skills shortage. Um, but obviously, um, consumer awareness still needs to uh, increase. And maybe that's one of the good things about COVID-19, as we mentioned and Louise mentioned, that the, uh, low, people started to recognise the value that uh, community organisations and social enterprise offer. And so one last poll now is more about the, what, what initiative would, sorry, what initiative would be most beneficial to short food supply chains? Uh, local cluster networks, distribution hubs, more training, up to, to upskill staff, volunteers, local food origin certificate, certificate or label, or better marketing campaigns, or better improved policy framework. And we can share these um, poll results after the presentation as well. Say that everyone's got their results in. So interestingly, the biggest one there seems to be distribution hubs, but it's distributed, the answers are distributed quite evenly across, across lots of different things. Um, so like local clusters, I think there is some good examples around the country of where local clusters and networks have worked well to showcase local produce. Distribution hubs is, is interesting that that's come out on top and maybe there's a missing link there between, we know obviously the likes of food cloud probably do provide a really valuable uh, link between um, growers and farmers, um, but also between the supermarkets. But obviously there's obviously parts of some food sectors or some parts of the food chain which are missing distribution hubs there. So that's quite interesting. Okay, I'll just stop sharing that. Thanks everyone for, is there, if anyone has any questions, they can raise their hands. Otherwise I'm very conscious that we ran way over time. So uh, we will be in touch. Um, as I said, the whole, the aim of this project really uh, was meant to be to take stakeholders. Um, so we we're meant to have stakeholders from Romania and Hungary come to here, Ireland, and perhaps we could have visited the likes of Jennifer's farm <laughs> or something like that there. Um, with COVID, we obviously can't. And then the idea is that we're, we're meant to take stakeholders out to Romania and look at um, good practices there and the same with Hungary. So perhaps if travel um, or restrictions lift in the next couple of months, we might be able to do that. But we'll keep all of you posted and keep you in the emailing list if that's okay with any updates. 
And we might also have like a local workshop just with the Irish stakeholders, so we'll be in touch. But I see Doris has her hand up. Yes, I have to say something. And first of all, thank you very much, Patrick. Very well organized. I was I was really impressed by all the presentation. Thank you very much for all the people attending. Um, thank you for the Romanian stakeholders being here with us today. Multumes, multumes, multumes. And a big round, a big round of applause for for my two Roxanas, to my two colleagues, that, uh, and to Marinella for you know being so active and and. Uh, getting everybody around and thank you very much to Julia and Camelia and really sorry for for being this long but apparently it's really really interesting so thank you